episode of The Exchange, I speak to Scott Davies, a former professional footballer whose career was cut short as a result of gambling. And Patrick Foster from Epic Risk Management talks about why gambling is so addictive. Hi, Patrick. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Uh, Thanks very much for having me. Not at all. It's lovely to have you on the exchange. My first question to you today is, what is gambling? Uh, Gambling is essentially uh, trying to turn money or something of monetary value uh, into an increased amount. Um, Gambling comes in all sorts of different forms, uh, whether that's sports betting, whether that's scratch cards, national lottery, uh, playing on casino type games, or indeed social betting uh, amongst friends, family. Um, But essentially what it is, is when you're trying to turn uh, a smaller amount of money or or something into something bigger. So obviously there's been a lot of talk about gambling in the media. And the main issue is what some people call problem gambling. What's the difference between problem gambling and gambling? Problem gambling uh, is essentially when gambling becomes a problem. It's when you have a continued urge uh, or compulsion to continue to do it despite uh, the negative impact or effect that it might be having on your life or or those around you. And in my opinion, it's all about control. Um, Problem gambling is when you you lose control of what you're doing. It stops being fun um, and it starts to become a problem. Um, I think statistically gambling is now the fastest growing and potentially most devastating addiction. Statistically, uh, 500,000 young people between the ages of 11 and 16 are gambling on a weekly basis. There are 55,000 problem gamblers under the age of 18 um, and those numbers are increasing um, year on year. Scott, thank you so much for joining us on the exchange today it'd be great to kind of just talk a bit about your background um obviously at 17 you were training um with the first team for reading um tell me a bit about that and how you got into gambling at that point yeah so for me i was living away from home the commute was sort of three buses and it would take three hours so it wasn't doable um i had to move in with a family in reading um, away from my sort of peers and my family and i was free to do what i wanted and i was only earning 50 pound a week at, at first as a scholarship um but that 50 pounds i saw other players at the football club that were flying helicopters to training believe it or not um there was a guy called les ferdinand who used to fly his helicopter in. And I thought that gambling would give me that life. I thought that I could get everything I wanted through gambling. So I started to experiment at a young age. Obviously, a lot of people um, who are watching this may well have their own experiences of gambling. Um, at some point with you, I guess it started off as just gambling. At what point did it move from gambling to problem gambling? Very quickly, um, I was earning £50 a week at the age of 16, 17. Um, At the age of 19, I was on £2,000 a week. So I'd gone from earning next to no money to over £100,000 a year. No one ever told me how to spend my money, how to invest it, how to look after it. So I felt like a a millionaire, to be honest, even though I wasn't. And I realised that my bets became a lot bigger than what they were. And it started to take over my life. Um, I crashed my car uh, on the way home from training one day. And there was a child sat in the back seat. And the reason why I crashed my car was because I was watching horse racing on my phone because I needed to be stimulated. I needed that buzz. And I certainly wasn't professional in in any stretch of the imagination. People would say to me um, after training, do you want to go down the bookmakers? And I wanted to go alone because I didn't want people seeing how much I was actually spending um, because I was ashamed of it. And in football, there is a culture that gambling is synonymous with professional footballers Uh, they go hand in hand and for me I realized that there was other people doing it uh, but they were kind of in control and I wasn't when it started to slip out of control I didn't know where to turn to to get the help Um, and then eventually my mum was the one that made the phone call for me to get help because I was um, feeling very low at the time my self-esteem had taken um, a pretty big beating I guess um, so to then try and ring up a rehabilitation centre, which is where I ended up for a month in 2015, 
the gap was too big um, to kind of bridge. Um, so my mum made that call and I was able to get the help that I needed. And um, was that, would you say, the turning point? Yeah, I'd lost about a quarter of a million pound at this point and about 60, 70,000 pound of my parents' money. So I was well into sort of 300,000 pound of, of wasted finance. And I knew that I was never going to win it all back. Um, but I just loved being in the environment. I was in the bookmakers one day and my mum was stood at the door when I turned around and I saw her in floods of tears crying her eyes out. So I ran over to the door and I was met with my mum saying, uh, you need to stop gambling, you're going to end up dead. To be honest, it hit me for six. I, I didn't know what to say to my mum. So I went home that night and I didn't see any way out. So I stupidly um, self-harmed that evening and it was something that I'd never done before. I knew it wasn't normal to do what I did. Um, I got scared and I went around my parents' house and I showed them exactly what I'd done. Um, I told them that I couldn't uh, no longer do what I was doing. Um, and then within two weeks, I was in a re uh, rehabilitation centre called Sporting Chance, where I spent uh, 28 days talking about all my problems and reflecting on it now. It was the best thing that ever happened to me because it gave me the opportunity to turn my life around. So when someone's got um, a gambling addiction, how does it get from that, from, I suppose, just having a bit of fun on maybe maybe an app or... Um, a loot box to a gambling addiction how does that happen in my opinion gambling is is very addictive because it's all about kind of winning and losing uh, so it's a drug um, around that feeling uh, and of course when you win uh, or you undertake a risk-taking behavior in terms of the impact that it has on your brain is dopamine is released and um, the more you do something um, the more you want that hit to get bigger, just like a drug. Um, a lot of the games are designed to be addictive. Um, some of the slot machines, um, casino type games that you play are all to do with kind of frequency, um, fast spins, bright lights, um, which actually are addictive. Um, and similarly, uh, there's now convergence between online gaming and gambling. Um, because some of the behaviours or things that you do within these online games or video games now are essentially gambling-related gambling, gambling behaviours, whether it's loot boxes, skins, sometimes known as packs, um, that are inbuilt into these games. The reason they are considered a form of gambling is because essentially what you do is you buy something, you want to get something out of that pack, uh, you might not get what you want. And so what it encourages you to do is to buy another one until you kind of get what you want. So it's it's there's a lottery um, element to it. Uh, the issue with that is that sometimes you may have to spend huge amounts of money if you're in search of, of one specific thing. Um, and often the things that you want to try and get, you need in order to get to the next level or, or beat somebody. Um, and there's very little or if any regulation around this. So there's nothing stopping a young person spending an infinite amount of, of money on one of these games. How did the advent of smartphones and online gambling apps sort of change the nature of, of this addiction for you? Yeah, yeah, it was, at the time it was great because I thought to myself, well, when Bookie's shut in, nine o'clock I can carry on going to whenever I want because there'll be sports going on in Thailand Mexico the USA Australia and there's no point where I have to put my phone off uh, switch my phone off and go to bed because there's nothing to bet on it was 24 7 all of a sudden but what it meant is that I wasn't in my own thoughts I wasn't by myself I felt like I had company because I had my phone and I had gambling um, and that for me was a comfort I suppose looking back at it um but really it was it was my biggest enemy when you come out of rehab what happens like are you hit with three hundred thousand pounds worth of debt that you have to you know how do they practically help you out for me it was sort of coping mechanisms of um how to deal with everyday life how to deal with losing my professional career from six years old i was desperate to be a professional footballer and i achieved it um but i probably didn't achieve what i wanted to achieve within the game with the opportunities that i had i was quite lucky that the money that I was earning was quite a large amount at times. Um, 
that I didn't get myself into loads and loads of debt. I was just being wasteful of the money that I was earning. So, for example, one month that I played in the championship with bonuses and wages, it was £23,000 for the month. So I didn't need to go and borrow off uh, lenders and banks. So I was quite fortunate in that respect that when I came out, I only had a small amount of debt. Um, and without my parents' help, I would have been in a lot more debt. Um, so for me, it was just about sort of recovering and stopping gambling. Um, and then three or four months later, I found myself going around to football clubs, telling my story um, of how it affected me and what I do now, um, how I sort of stay away from gambling. Um, and for me, that's the, the best medicine I could ever ask for. What would you say to anyone watching this who is struggling with perhaps low level problem gambling or perhaps something much, much more serious? Where would you point them to? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's as simple as it's just really important that you talk about it. Um, the second that you recognize that you're losing control, whether that's control of time, money, um, or uh, just generally uh, the way you're feeling, your mental health um, or your cognition, that's when you need to have those conversations. You need to reach out for help because, as I found, it's very easy to think that you can deal with that problem yourself. You can just stop. But actually, it's, it's not the more you do something, the more likely you are to be addicted to it or the more likely it is to become a bigger problem. So early intervention is possible. So when you recognize those signs in yourself or if you recognize them in somebody else, then do something about it. Talk to somebody. There is a lot of support out there that is available, but talking about it and, and trying to use what is there is, is the most important thing and the best bit of advice I could give for anybody, to anybody. Patrick, thank you so much for coming on The Exchange today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me.